Next to you, it's the rule. By Luna, my love. Chapter 3. Queen Dahlia of Kent. The third rule to know when staying in Camelot, and the first rule to know when the royal entourage of Camelot comes to visit you, is that Merlin is not allowed to wander freely on his own. Especially in foreign kingdoms! Arthur has rules for this. They must be followed. Strictly. When Queen Dahlia of Kent sent her daughter, Princess Millie, to Camelot under the pretenses of their new peace treaty, she was hoping it would result in an engagement. Camelot and Kent have always been on peaceful terms. Millie is a bit younger than King Arthur, being only 16, making her 12 years his junior, as the king is only 8 years younger than Dahlia herself. But she will make a wonderful queen and wife. Age is but a number, and King Arthur is the most eligible bachelor in all of Albion. The match would be one made in the heavens. It is quite disappointing, then, when her daughter returns unengaged with the most peculiar stories about the king and his court sorcerer. Apparently, the two are inseparable and engaged in all but name. Dahlia tells her daughter that if it is not official, then she still has a chance. Millie seems set on the fact that she does not. However, Millie has always been practical and able to see things as they are, so Dahlia is inclined to believe her. She is even more stunned when Millie mentions that most of the kingdom calls the court sorcerer the queen whenever he and the king are not present. This, Dahlia thinks, calls for investigation. Dahlia loves investigating. King Arthur and his entourage arrive a month later. Since the former King Uther's death, Arthur has been renegotiating peace treaties and trade agreements and has set about meeting the kings and queens of all the kingdoms of Albion. While Kent and Camelot have always been on peaceful terms, their relationship has never been strong. Dahlia and her husband, King Harold, welcome the negotiations as there are many benefits to having stronger ties to Camelot. It is also a welcome surprise when King Arthur is nothing like his father. The man is noble, fair, and kind to all. Harold is pleased upon meeting the younger king. Dahlia finds herself once again wishing her daughter had a chance at marriage with him. She watches carefully, hoping to see what her daughter saw upon her visit to Camelot. Harold tells her to leave it be, but he's always been a spoil sport, and Dahlia loves gossip and stories of true love. From what Millie told her, this is certainly the case. It is easy to spot the court sorcerer when the group arrives. He is riding next to the king, not behind him, as if they are equals. He also exudes power. As Dahlia loves gossip, she has heard a great many things about the sorcerer, or should she say warlock? She knows how powerful he is. It is rumored that he can destroy kingdoms with merely the blink of an eye. Millie told her that he was a kind man, but if anyone tries to harm the king, he is not afraid to kill without mercy. Looking at the man, she is inclined to once again believe Millie's initial assessment. He is smiling at the king and saying something that makes them both laugh, while simultaneously surveying their surroundings for any possible threat. He will not find one in Kent. At least, she hopes he won't. Everyone is pleased with the burgeoning relationship between Camelot and Kent. Nevertheless, she plans to proceed with caution. Dahlia knows that Harold plans to as well. Neither of them wants to pose any sort of threat, lest they upset the sorcerer or King Arthur. Millie also tells them that for as much as they should treat King Arthur well for fear of the court sorcerer, they should treat the court sorcerer equally. Like they would a visiting queen, she says. Treating him poorly garners the rage of King Arthur, which is equally frightening. As such, Dahlia makes sure to prepare the two largest guest chambers next to each other, of course. For the two men, she has scheduled time for her and the court sorcerer to have tea, as she would any other visiting queen, and has informed the rest of the castle to treat them as such. She has taken extreme measures to make sure everything is set for their arrival. They arrive with ten knights and two personal servants. Dahlia watches as King Arthur slips off his horse gracefully, before helping the court sorcerer off of his horse, as he would his queen. The court sorcerer takes his hand with ease like this is a commonality. Dahlia is becoming more grateful for Millie by the second. As they approach, they fall into step side by side, with their men following behind them. The sorcerer does, however, allow King Arthur to step forward first when introducing himself. Harold smiles warmly. King Arthur, it is an honor to finally meet you. Arthur matches the smile. It is an honor to meet you as well, King Harold. 
I apologize that it has taken so long to meet in person. It has no matter. I know you have a been a busy man. My daughter says you were very welcoming upon her visit, for which I am grateful. We enjoyed having her and welcome her any time she wishes to visit. He turns to Dahlia. Queen Dahlia, it is a pleasure. Thank you, King Arthur. It is for me as friend. Dahlia replies. Arthur beckons his court horse forward. This is my court sorcerer, Merlin. Merlin bows his head lightly. It is an honor to meet you both. Closer up, Dahlia can see why the king would fancy this young man. He is rather beautiful, his features almost elvish in nature. She'll have to ask if there is any elvish in his blood. His smile is genuine, and his eyes sparkle with delight. She died to think this was a man to fear, if not for the tales she'd heard. We are just as honored to meet you, Dahlia says. We have heard a great many things about both of you. Oh, good, I hope, Merlin says as his grand thirst mischievous. Dahlia thinks she likes him kind of been already. She's always been rather mischievous herself. Of course. Allow me to show you to your rooms. My servants will take your travel bags. She is pleased when they appear to enjoy their rooms, and even more pleased when the welcoming feast goes well. She watches as they take turns stealing food off of each other's plates and are almost constantly touching. It's almost imperceptible, but she is sure that their seats are closer together than they were before they sat. When it is time for tea the next day, Merlin arrives with a bow and a smile. Thank you for the invite, Queen Dahlia. Dahlia waves her hand. Please, it is just Dahlia, Lord Merlin. Then it is just Merlin, if you don't mind. I've never been one for titles. Neither have I. I believe we hail from similar backgrounds, you and I. I was also a servant before I became queen. I never grew used to titles like my husband. Merlin's smile turns more genuine. It is nice to have someone who understands. Yes, it is. Dahlia agrees, gesturing toward the display of tea. Their conversation is fascinating. She finds herself enthralled by the man who informs her that he is the last dragon lord, which confirms her theory that he has some elvish blood. Dragon lords descend from elves, she tells him. Merlin, not having known this, asks her what else she knows about dragon lords. Apparently, Camelot is still working on restoring their magical library and lacks material on the subject. Dahlia offers to show him their library, which houses a small section on dragon lords. She also speaks of her job as the queen, as Camelot has not had one in a great while. It stands to reason that there is no one to show Merlin the way. She tells him that if he ever has any questions about the queen's jobs and priorities, he can write to her. He looks a little confused, but promises that he will write to her regardless, if acceptable, as he quite enjoys her company. Dahlia agrees to this instantly, and she quite enjoys his company too. She also finds that she is correct in her theory that he is as mischievous as she. She spends the rest of the afternoon showing him all the secret passageways in the castle and playing pranks on unsuspecting passers-by. Merlin's magic is very helpful in that. Dahlia has not had this much fun in a long time. Lily will no doubt tell her to act her age, but she is not that old, and her daughter inherited her father's lack of ingenuity, which is incredibly boring for Dahlia. It is much to her disappointment that on the third day of their stay, she is stuck with Harold and Arthur discussing the peace treaty. It is rather boring since Merlin isn't there. He is supposed to be, but as this meeting is mostly just boring drivel, of which neither of them is interested, they decided Merlin would feign ill and use one of the secret passageways to go to the market and buy them some strawberry tarts. Harold rarely lets her enjoy them ever since he has decided to only eat healthy food, which means the whole castle can only eat healthy food, and Merlin loves strawberries, so it's a perfect plan. Dahlia would have feigned ill herself, but she is too recognizable, and they thought it might look suspicious if they both claimed sick, especially after the sheep incident. So, here Dahlia is in this boring meeting, dreaming of strawberry tarts, while her husband and the King of Camelot drone on about things that they decided over letters long before today, when the doors burst open! Two Camelot knights, she believes their names are Leon and Percival, Hold on to a squirming Merlin with a few more knights trailing behind them. She'd laugh if she wasn't so disappointed about the strawberry tarts that they will no longer get to eat. We found him trying to sneak out of the castle through a secret passage, sir. 
Leon says, all the while Merlin is muttering for them to let him go. They do, placing him down gently as if he's made of glass. Merlin smiles in an attempt to pretend as if he was not dragged into the room by knights. Hello, Harold. Dahlia? Dahlia tries not to laugh. Hello, Merlin. I heard you were ill. You must be feeling better then. Harold asks, undoubtedly aware that it is Dahlia who put him up to this if a secret passageway was involved. Moans, actually. Thank you for asking. Arthur, in no mood to deal with Merlin's nonsense, gets straight to the point. Morning! Don't you even try to act innocent? I know you were faking ill! I know it! So, you had the knights follow me? Merlin responds, all traces of the previous smile gone. I knew you were up to no good! Merlin scoffs. I just wanted to go to the market! Arthur pinches the bridge of his nose, taking a deep breath before speaking. So you faked ill and tried to sneak out of the castle using a secret passageway that you shouldn't even be aware of. Harold glares at Dahlia. Dahlia thinks the window is very interesting. This meeting is super boring and I knew you'd make me take a bunch of guards for a good reason. You are out of your mind if you think I'm letting you leave this castle by yourself. Do you not remember what happened in Gabon? That wasn't my fault! The Lemon Towns had to be quarantined for three days. Again! Not my fault! I don't even get me stolen on Nemeth! That is not fair! How was I supposed to know when Assassin was after me? You called it oven on fire. That was great, and I put it out! Arthur, who is now standing and looking far more agitated than Dahlia has seen in this entire visit, points at Merlin angrily. You always nag me about my health, but you are the reason I'm going to die of a heart attack! My heart is racing, Merlin! Oh my god, it's racing! Merlin grunts. Fine! If I say please, can I skip the meeting and go to the market? I will take one card! When Arthur continues to stare at him, uncompromising, Merlin changes tactics. He shuffles forward demurely, a look of innocence in his eyes as he approaches Arthur. Dahlia would fall for it too if she didn't know any better. Arthur narrows his eyes, wary of the man that stops in front of him. Merlin continues to blink up at him with wide eyes as he tugs on the sleeve of Arthur's tunic. Please? I'll be good, I promise. Arthur sighs. Merlin! Please? Merlin draws out, continuing to tug softly at the tunic. Dahlia told me about this shop they have in town that sells books, and some of them are about magic. You know I've been wanting to build our library. He jabs out his lip. And there won't be any other time with all the meetings we have, and you don't need me for this one, pretty please. I'll bring you back some strawberry tarts. Harold, well aware of Dahlia's obsession with strawberry tarts, is definitely glaring holes into her head. Dahlia finds it much more fascinating to watch the resolve fall from King Arthur's eyes at the mere batting of his court sorcerer's eyelashes. Arthur sighs again. You will take full nights, too, Merlin demands. Dahlia has to put her hand over her mouth to prevent her friend from laughing. Harold keeps glaring at her as if she caused this, which, to be fair, she did. But she knows, he finds it just as funny. These men are some of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, men in all of Albion. It is pretty hilarious. Four, or you won't go. Merlin bows. I get to pick them. You can pick two, and I'll pick two. Merlin considers this as if he is the one who will have the final say in the decision. Dahlia is starting to think he is at the end of the day. Deal. I pick no way. You didn't say my up, Merlin. Will you stop with that? Merlin. Fine. Lancelot and Carl. Carl? Carl. If this is because he lets you do whatever you want and bows to you, you said I could pick whoever I want aside from Gwen, so I picked Carl. Arthur ups. Okay, I pick Leon. Oh, come on! He never lets me do anything! Leon coughs behind him. Merlin purposefully ignores him. Exactly, Merlin. Leon listens to me. Everyone else is far too lenient with you. They are not! Shall I mention the visit to Anglia? Will you get over that already? I told you I was sorry. I didn't mean to incite a riot. Dahlia is going to have to get all of these stories out of Merlin. Merlin, your heart, I know. Merlin mimics. Leon and who? Arthur smirks. Mordred. Merlin's face turns red. No, I hate him. Dahlia hears a squeak 
come from one of the knights that ever behind Merlin. She has only learned the names of the ones most often around the sorcerer, but that one must be Mordred. For no reason! I have every reason! The dragon said, I do not care what the dragon said, Merlin. Mordred promised not to kill me. Now he is a little confused now. Of course he did! That's what the killer would say! Arthur crosses his arms and stares sternly at the sorcerer. It is Mordred and Leon or nothing, Merlin. Take it or leave it. Merlin sticks his nose at him. Fine! Only because if he's with me, he can't kill you, Merlin! And just to be clear, if something were to happen to him, Dolly hears a much louder squeak this time. Merlin, if you harm him in any manner, I will write to Hooneth. Merlin gasps. How dare you bring my mother into this! Arthur grins. Smugly. I'll do it, and you know I will. Hooneth adores me. Yeah, well, I'll tell her that you're lying and she loves me more, so she'll believe me. She told me she loves us equally. Well, she's a liar. She only said that because she didn't want to hurt your feelings. Arthur shrugs. I guess we'll find out when I write her. Merlin sees this. Fine, but when Morgan tries to kill you, he won't. Merlin stops his butt in a very queenly manner. Dolly is a bit biased because she was the one who taught him, but she thinks he does it extremely well. She is pleased. That's it. I knew it. I know it! You love him more than me! Dahlia, having spotted the one named Mordred in the crowd of knights, thinks the boy may faint. <laughs> Arthur looks to the sky, patience appearing to be running thin. Are you serious right now, Merlin? Are we going to do this here? Merlin sticks his chin up as if saying that, yes, they are doing this here. You always take his side, just admit it! I do not! Your hatred for him is out of hand. It is not! My job is to protect you! I do not need protection from Mordred. He is not going to hurt me. Mordred, tell Merlin that you aren't going to hurt me. Mordred steps forward jiggly. I will not harm King Arthur. I promise, Enris. I swear it on my life, though limited. I also swear it on my magic. Merlin squints the night, looking for any detection of a lie, and helps when he finds none. I still say you love him more than me. You do always take his side. Arthur groans and shoves the heels of his hands into his eyes as if he could block out the entire conversation. Manning, I do not love Mordred more than you. You know you're my favorite. I know you know it. You abuse the position all the time. You're abusing it right now. Merlin smiles widely at him. I'm your favorite, he says as if he actually did not know. Arthur is not fooled. You're a menace, Merlin. A menace. But I'm your favorite man, is right? Arthur smiles softly. Unfortunately. There's a tender moment between the two as they look at each other with loving eyes that Dahlia doesn't think is meant for others to watch. She watches anyway. It's not every day you get to witness true love. We have a new agreement then, Arthur says after a moment. I suppose, Merlin grumbles, trying not to look entirely too pleased. No, the rules. Rules? Yes, rules, Merlin. They are used to prevent things from being burnt down in villages for being quarantined. I hate you! Arthur disregards the statement. Leon, Mordred, I need you to listen to me very carefully. Merlin doesn't understand the meaning of rules. Lancelot lets him get away with whatever he wants. And Carl doesn't know that which is Merlin. Yes, I am! They both say simultaneously. Nottingham feels bad for Merlin, whose pout is growing by the second. He is to be escorted at all times. Do not let him out of your sight. I don't care what he says. If he yells fire, that doesn't work on Leon anymore. You ask him to escort you to the place of the fire because most likely there is no fire and he's a no good liar. And you're an ass! He is not to leave your company for even a second. And if he yells assassin, you better protect him with your life because he is serious. He doesn't lie about that. We don't lie about assassins. Right, Merlin? Merlin sulks, scuffing the floor with his shoe. Right? Arthur nods. And he is not allowed to eat blueberries. But I, I do not care how much you like them, Merlin. You are allergic. Only a little. No, a lot. You almost died. I did not. Your throat swelled. You couldn't breathe. I used my magic to kill myself. Barely. You almost passed out. Merlin rolls his eyes. But I didn't. Arthur leans forward, actually clutching his chest this time. It's racing. You are so dramatic. Merlin. Ah. I won't eat any blueberries. Will you stop that? It's giving me anxiety. How will I know when you are having a real heart attack, Arthur? You could die, and I'll have thought you were faking it. Arthur stops clutching his heart, accepting that he won the argument, and continues. 
You want to check everything he eats. Everything. You are so embarrassing! And he is not allowed near any cows. Merlin deflates. Okay, that's fair. Is that all understood? Arthur asks. Yes, sire. The knights say. Merlin? Yes, you stupid cabbage head! Merlin mutters. Arthur grins like the statement is a compliment. Great. I'll expect you back at the castle no later than an hour before supper. That's five hours, Merlin. Don't complain. I wasn't going to. I'll meet you in your room beforehand, Merlin says. I'll see you then. Be good. Merlin scouts. I'm always good. Dahlia chooses this moment to clear her throat. Could I tag along? No! Harold and Arthur yell a bit loudly in her opinion. Of course, Merlin says at the same time. No, no, no. Harold continues. Absolutely not. Do you think we didn't hear about the sheep? Arthur exclaims. Dahlia purses her lips. This is an exaggeration. We did not know that would happen if we fed it cake. Yeah, how are we supposed to know it would puke the cake all over Lord Archibald? Merlin says. Merlin! Arthur shouts. His pants caught fire magically and he had to roll in the puke to put it out. How do you know it was a magical fire? Maybe they just caught fire on their own. Merlin sniffs. Dahlia has the utter smirk. She also taught him how to sniff heartily like that. It's an important expression for queens to have. He wears it well. Dahlia nods. I heard there was a piece of flint in his pocket. That could have caused its pants to catch on fire. Harold points his finger at her. Points it! The audacity of the man! Dahlia, we know... The two of you planned it. We are not stupid. You cannot prove you've had it for years. That doesn't mean anything, Harold. I will not have you accusing me of something that I did not do. You asked the questions for cake. Marlin and I thought the sheep would like it. As he said, we did not know it would make it sick. Harold sighs. Dahlia. Arthur is looking like he may strangle Merlin again. Dahlia sticks her nose up. Harold, I wish to go to the market with Marlin. Harold looks so done. Dahlia, though, has just begun. I thought you planned this. You thought of the secret passageways so you could get some of those stupid strawberry tarts. Harold, Dahlia says sternly, I wish to go to the market with Marlin. Harold sits up straighter, probably to intimidate her, stupid man. Dahlia, I will not be swayed as easily as Arthur. I was not swaying easily, Arthur shouts. Merlin, mind that smoke off your face. Merlin looks away to hide the grin that he can't seem to stop. Harold shakes his head. You were, Arthur. I watched it happen with my own two eyes. All he had to do was bat his eyelashes. That is not true. I stood strong for a whole two seconds. Dahlia does not have time for this. She wants to go to the market with Merlin. Harold, she growls. I wish to go to the market with Merlin. Or else. Or else, Harold asks in disbelief. Dahlia narrows her eyes. Or else, I will cry. That seems to do it for Harold if the look of panic on his face is anything to go by. If you go with Marla, there is no way I am sending you with just four cards. Arthur scoffs. And you say I'm swearing easily. I tried. Harold slumps in his chair. I really did. Arthur seems to sympathize. But you are right. Four guards cannot contain them. The protests from Merlin and Dahlia go unheard. I will send four of my men as well, Harold says. They know the rules for Dahlia, but just in case I will tell them to go, men. This is absolutely ridiculous, Dahlia declares. Harold pays her no mind as he looks at the four men ready to escort Merlin, Melancelot, and Carl having arrived one month ago. Dahlia is not to go near any chickens. Harold, Dahlia says, only to be ignored by her husband once. Arthur cuts in. No sheep for them either. Harold nods. I think they should be banned from all animals. That's a good idea. No animals at all. And Dahlia is not allowed into the butcher's shop. Arthur waves his hand. Merlin would pass it on sight. They never let him in there anyway. Merlin's protests are feeble. It is a fair statement. Good. She is not allowed to go near Lord Dunlanos either, or Lady Catherine. My men will know them on sight. They will let you know if either of them is near. Dahlia is to be escorted away immediately. If Dahlia can't be near them, then neither can Merlin, Arthur adds. Yes, we will not want another Lord Archibald. Incident. 
And of course, she is to be kept in sight at all times. Harold says, You're the worst, Harold, Dahlia says, rising from her seat. Arthur's the worst, too, Merlin says supportively as he offers her his arm. The four guards that Harold calls add to their entourage as they head to the doors. What did you think of my stop? Dahlia smiles. It was beautifully executed. I've never been prouder. And the way you batted your eyes. That was a work of art. You must show me. Merlin smirks. Thank you, my lady, but I must insist you show me your method in return. Tell me, does repeating yourself sternly like that work every time? Dahlia pats his arm. Oh, every time. And if he doesn't listen, the first few times I threaten to cry. It always gets him. I can show you how. That's fascinating. I was thinking, no, Arthur yells. Stop them. Harold scrambles to his feet, but it is too late. The doors have swung shut behind the two as they maniacally plot ways to convince their kings to do their bidding. A few days later, when they are saying their goodbyes, Dahlia hugs Merlin and makes him promise to write to her. She sends him with their best books on dragon lords, which he promises to send back as soon as possible, but she demands he keeps as a gesture of good faith, and as many queen lessons as she could fit into their allotted time together. He is an amazing student. He's a natural, really, and she has no doubt that he will put the lessons to good use. She even learned some new things herself. Merlin still looked confused whenever she mentioned anything about the lessons having to do with being a queen, but she'll let him figure that out on his own. She watches as Arthur helps him onto his horse, and they ride away side by side. She will miss her new friend greatly. She'll have to plan for her and Harold to visit Camelot soon. I told you he was taken. Nilly says as they wave goodbye. Their relationship is unlike any other I've seen before. That's true love, Dahlia says wistfully. God, mother, you're such a sap. Nilly rolls her eyes. It's a good thing they left today. I thought father was going to lose his head if you got into any more mischief with Merlin. Sometimes I think I'm more of an adult than you. Dahlia sniffs, very queenly like. I'll have you know, a little bit of fun never hurt anyone. Nilly smirks. I think Lord Archibald. Would disagree. Later, as the evening stretches into the night and they've been riding their horses for hours, Arthur refuses to let the knights and Merlin stop for the night. He is convinced that they can ride a few more hours before resting. Merlin is tired, though, and hungry. A tired and hungry Merlin is not good for anyone. He also knows that the knights want to stop, too, but Arthur keeps ignoring his complaining. He's too used to it after years of going on hunting trips and quests together. Merlin tried to do it the easy way, but he has had enough. He wants to sleep. He straightens his back, holding himself in the most queenly manner possible. Not that he knows it's queenly. Arthur, he says loud enough for all of the knights to hear. Their grumbling quiets as they turn to listen. I wish to stop for the night. I am tired and need rest. I already told you, Merlin, we will ride for four more hours. Arthur! I wish to stop for the night. I am tired and need rest. Arthur whips his head around. Don't you dare. Merlin dares. Arthur, I wish to stop for the night. I am tired and need rest. If we do not stop, I will cry. Arthur glares at him. Are you serious? You think you get... A sniffle comes first. But it's the sob that makes Arthur slow his horse to a stop. The knights follow his lead, stopping behind them and staring at the scene in awe. Gawain has to put a fist in his mouth to stop himself from laughing. Arthur wonders if he can quit his life. Maybe go live on a farm or something. Arthur! Sniffle. I wish to stop for the knights! There are tears now. I'm tired! I need rest! More tears and sniffles and stops. No! He yells, stop! Stop going! Merlin keeps crying. Arthur! He jokes on his own. I wish to stop for the night. Hang up. Okay, okay, we can set up a for the night if you stop crying. There was a clearing or two minute ride with him. Please, stop. Sniffle. Okay. Merlin says his voice barely above a whisper. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Another sob. Arthur just wants the cry to stop. You did it. He says softly, I'm not upset. You're right. We should stop for the night. Everyone is tired and hungry and it is too dark to continue on. Merlin wipes his tears. If you really think so. I do. Arthur nods aggressively. We should stop. It's a good idea. 
Okay, if you insist, Merlin says, still looking too sad for Arthur to bear. I do. Now, come on. Arthur urges, starting up his horse again. I'll help you set up your bedroll so you can go right to sleep when we get them. Merlin sniffles. Okay, thank you. It's no problem, Merlin. Arthur replies, already ahead of the group. It's because of this that he misses the devious swag Merlin sends the knights. The knights think that maybe they should be concerned about this, but quite frankly, they are too tired to care. They are a little miffed when Arthur really does help Merlin set up his build roll immediately upon entering the camp, wrapping Merlin in his cloak and the thickest blanket and letting him fall asleep while the rest of them set up camp and cook dinner. Merlin did it for them for years, though, and what can they really say? He is the queen.